are delighted to uh, have Zainab Tufekshi speak with us. She is a fellow here at CITP. Uh, she is visiting this year and has done a tremendous amount of work on uh, social media and social movements. Among other things, she's worked on the Arab Spring, uh, but she is truly interdisciplinary um, in the way that we love around here. She's a recovering computer programmer, and uh, today she's going to talk to us about uh, big data, how we think about that, and some methodological pitfalls uh, that may exist in big data research. So, Zainab, I'll just let you take over from there. Well, thank you. Um, so, he actually pronounced my name right. I am about to break down and cry here. Um, but, uh, so I'm Zainab Tufekci, and uh, I wanted to, I, I've been thinking about this for a while, and I wanted to sort of uh, do a methodological paper to get feedback. These are not very common. People don't really publish methodology papers in a lot of fields. But this is a very emergent field, and I'm feeling like there's a lot of issues that uh, could benefit from thinking through at the intersection of social science, computer science, and partly physics, because there's a lot of physicists uh, in this world. So, and my subtitle is, Whoa there, cowboy, because I don't think, I, I've seen like 50 or so big data is going to fill in the blank news articles in just the past week or two. So this has really become sort of important. People are looking at it. People are looking at, you know, I can see lots of very interesting uses, but I also see some methodological pitfalls that are not being addressed as much. So what do I mean by the big data? Uh, it's this, uh, what happened is we've always had, we've maybe for a couple of centuries, we've had data that is bigger then we can just kind of hold in our head and just sort of analyze on back of an envelope. But what's happened in the past few years is that an increasing amount of social interaction and increasing amount of informational interaction happens in a sphere where there is permanence, right? It used to be you would ask people and there'd be no record of it. And there's an increasing amount of recording, this permanence of things that used to be ephemeral and not connected. So that has given rise to these all these imprints being stored has given rise to these large data sets, which you can analyze for fascinating things. One thing I read yesterday was people looking at drug interactions by looking at searches of drug A, drug B symptom, right? Because drug interactions are notoriously hard to figure out. You know, there's lots of people taking lots of drugs, and does this really interact with this? Are you going to do a clinical study for every possible interaction? It's not really easy, and adverse uh, reports might not be done. And they were able to, they had a very significant effect of two drugs that people had been suspecting. People who were taking them both had like double the odds of searching for a particular symptom uh, than uh, people who were not. So this is a great use, and this is something you couldn't do without big data. This is Google big data. On the other hand, recently we learned Google's flu trends was overestimating flu by about double. And it's one, one of the reasons for that is one of my... Examples. So this is the kind of universe I'm talking about. So let me go through uh, the problem with this paper is that it's kind of jarring that I'm going to go from method to method to method to method. I'm just sort of trying to survey a bunch of issues here. And the paper, I posted it in the Social Science Research Network site. It's draft, but I'd love feedback and criticisms and examples. So. Problem number one is, this is the Drosophila. The problem number one I see with this is the model organism problem, which is that the data analysis uh, that is being done is what people are drawn to, is the things that are available, easy to access, and have certain characteristics. And that, in this particular moment, happens mostly to be Twitter. There's a bunch of reasons for that. If anybody is doing big data analysis, you know why. It used to be fairly easy to get access at large Twitter data sets, and they downloaded as these neat little JSON sort of uh, fields, and you could, it was nicely structured, and it's not very big, and there's a lot of activity, and there's all sorts of things that make Twitter both an easy data set to analyze and accessible, and fascinating papers have come out of it. But what do I mean by the model organism problem? See, in biology, a lot of research is done on Drosophila because this little fruit fly is fairly easy to breed in the lab. It uh, has a close 
connection between its genotype and phenotype so that if you mess with a few alleles here and there, you get another wing. And it's like, wow, you know, you do this and you get another wing kind of thing. And there's a quick life cycle, so you can go through many, many, many generations. So if you're going to do genetic research, you know, you're not going to do it on pandas, right? It's not going to be the best idea to publish in your lifetime and get tenure. So there's about eight or so, eight to ten uh, model organisms biologists use greatly. But they all have the same characteristics. They are pro they're sensitive to genetics. They tend to breed quickly. They're, they work in the lab settings, which means that they are over-representing certain characteristics. What are those characteristics? Well, being prone to genetics. If you, could, if you talk with anybody in biology who's working in de development or e ecology, they complain about this all the time. People do Drosophila research, find some big example for genetics because you've selected it because it's sensitive to genetics, and then you go and say, I have just found the gene for being super risk taker and left handed and human. I mean, you, you go from like the sort of genetic analysis that's being done on specific organisms that are sensitive to this, then you start generalizing and forget the fact that there's a big methodological issue here. Uh, and biology has been trying to deal with this. They're trying to develop better model organisms. Now, there's great benefits to model organism research. Everybody working on the same set. You have the Drosophila genome, you can do lots of things. So, similarly, Twitter has certain, those characteristics that make it easy, means that it is exactly, it has certain significant weaknesses. The fact that it's got this nice data structure and the fact that uh, tweets are public, therefore easy to analyze, means that it's a very particular kind of behavior. And if you start doing, you know, influence papers and how influence works in society and you base it on Twitter, well, you're working in a very specific environment. And I think this is one problem with, um, the, this kind of unacknowledged problem of, so what are the specifics of Twitter that make it attractive and what does that mean? And I, line, I, I, I outline some of those characteristics in more detail in the paper. Facebook research is done a little more, but again, that can only be done on public data sets. And then there's all sorts of other kinds of data that, if, you know, that are harder to get that are not looked at as much. So that's the model organism problem. Problem number two is selecting on the dependent variable in the research. This is a social science, very common issue in social science. If you're um, studying especially uh, rare events, for example, revolutions, wars, this is storming of the Bastille, right? It was a big deal of sorts, although uh, there were seven people left in the prison by the time it was stormed, four forgers one aristocrat who was gay and they think one murder or something. So it was a but. Um, so it's, it's this big thing uh, in our imagination and the French Revolution. And, you know, if you ask sociologists, I'm going to do something on a revolution, they usually ask you which one, you know, the French, the Chinese, the Russian. Those are sort of the uh, archetypal revolutions. You can count other revolutions too, but it's a finite number. You know, this kind of big revolutions are rare in history. So if you start looking at what makes them happen, and if you study only revolutions, well, you are going to end up with what we would call necessary but not sufficient conditions because there would be a lot of events that didn't end up being revolutions that you're not studying because you're selecting on the already successful revolutions. It's kind of like studying all the A students and figuring out they all get up at 8 a.m., which I just made this up, and then saying getting up at 8 a.m. is likely to make you successful. Well, it might be something that has a connection to it, but if you're not looking at all the other 8 a.m. people who are not um, looking, you know, who are not uh, ga making A's, you can't do this. So why does this come up with big data sets? Well, a lot of big data sets are selecting on events. They're selecting on hashtags. And I've rarely seen what the, this analysis of what is the culture of this hashtag. You know, because it, a hashtag is a self-selection. It's a group of people who are using this in particular. And they come with a culture. They come with uh, particular dependencies. For example, if you look at, uh, say, January 25, which is the Egyptian revolution, you find that it's almost always a supportive group. January 25 as a hashtag is used mostly by people who support the idea of the revolution. If you look at Bahrain, the hashtag Bahrain, which also used a lot by people supporting the Bahrain uprising, it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of people using that hashtag. It's more, you know, it's more contested a space. 
Uh, so the January 25 hashtag would have a different subset of kind of people. It's the same thing for anything. If you're looking at people who are participating in a political debate hashtag, anything that requires you to go to Twitter and put that hashtag, that's a self-selection, and that's a selection on dependent variable. And if you're going to do that, and now it's fine, you can do this. It's just you have to recognize that you have to go back and say, what are the sort of methodological implications of selecting this group of people who are choosing themselves? Um, the other questions I have are about sampling universe and representativeness. So there was a pay, there was an um, P research. Yeah, P research came up yesterday with a U.S. analysis. It's about, Twitter is about 10 percent of the. U, uh, U.S. population. So there, you've just got this obvious representativeness issues. Anytime you sample your Twitter data set, not only are you subsampling and then selecting on dependent variable if you're doing hashtag, you're looking at 10% of the population. It's an important 10% of the population. A lot of influential early adopters are there, but you're doing that. The other problem, uh, I call this the denominator problem, is that when you look at something and you say, you know, 50 million people retweeted this, or 3 million people clicked like. You have no idea what the denominator of that is. You don't know how many people could have seen it. I mean, 50 million out of how many? Uh, I mean, with Twitter, you get out of 10%, so that's your upper bound. But see, what's your lower bound? And that's not a minor question. There's a paper, again, one couple days ago. Um, I saw it a couple days ago. It was a Kai paper. Uh, Facebook in-house researchers have a paper out that estimates the actual audience of um, Facebook status updates versus what people think is being seen. And apparently, 30 to 40 percent of a friend network sees your Facebook status update. So this is the first indication we have of a denominator. And it's an indication that we can work at getting these denominators. I mean, think of television ratings or polling, right? When you do polling, you have this likely voter screening. When you do television ratings, you have some sense of how many people have the television open. You need something like this in big data research. Otherwise, you're just throwing out absolute numbers without anything anchoring them to a denominator. So, you know, we have no idea if you know, this person um, and we don't really know who the audience is. I mean, this is a funny cartoon, but the, my point is you really have no idea if anybody's seeing what you're posting and what the retweet means because it's Facebook is, has algorithms that change who sees what, Twitter has flows of day, and all sorts of reasons that things are not seen. So uh, I'm going quickly through all of this again. I mean, this is just a wide field, and I, and I want to leave time for discussion. As I said, the paper is... Uh, out there. So let's look at um, the ecology problem. Okay, so this is a picture I took in Tahrir in 2011 during a demonstration. And on that eighth floor right there where I have the little arrow is the Al Jazeera camera. That's your, you know, Ayman, uh, and it's sort of um, right there. There's a very funny story about how that camera got there. So they were like during the initial unrest, they were trying like mad to find a spot where they could oversee the whole place and they just could not find it because the people who lived around Tahrir weren't sympathetic and they were scared for good reason. You know, this is still the Mubarak regime. So he's like talking uh, his way into various buildings through the doorman, which in Egypt in those buildings they would have them, and just knocking on doors and just getting his door slammed on his face. So he goes up to the state floor and this disheveled dude who looks like he hasn't slept in days wearing a Che t-shirt opens the door. Ayman's like, oh, you want to make history? And he says yes, and that camera gets there. And that's the only reason you have that camera uh, there. But what, what happens in places that don't have a camera on the ground? You know, where we're in Tunisia, we didn't, have any, we didn't have Al Jazeera. What happens in a lot of other places? Well, what happens is you have an enormous amount of citizen media being uploaded. But here's the thing. The citizen media that gets uploaded rarely gets seen unless, you know, widely, unless it's also broadcast in Al Jazeera. This was the case in the Arab Spring. There was this ecology of citizen media, Al Jazeera, then to CNN, that got things around the place. So if you were just looking at Twitter or Facebook or any kind of single platform, you would be completely missing the story. So anybody who's doing analysis of a spread of a piece of information on just Twitter or Facebook or any single platform, 
It's kind of like looking for light, uh, your keys under the light. I understand why the data set is attractive. I'm not saying that you don't learn anything from it, but information flows are almost never single platform. There's uh, a lot of research on this, it's all, and people don't think of them as these isolated spaces the way our research tends to treat them. So you've got to get at this platform. How do you do this? It's not easy, I understand. I mean, I'm not sort of minimizing the research difficulties here, but at least we can start thinking about it. And it might involve following some people around for a while, you know, the people, kind of the people research um, just the data side. So these are some methodological problems. Let's talk about some of the uh, conceptual issues. So interpreting retweets. I have seen so many papers that interpret a retweet as an influence. It's a sign of influence, right? Yeah, kind of. You're making someone do something. But here's one that, uh, an unfortunate one, after the, um, there's a mass um, shooting at the Aurora Theater in Colorado. There have been so many, I'm getting them confused. But that was, uh, so Aurora is apparently also a dress inspired by Kim Kardashian. So the Sela Boutique, uh, whose social media intern or whomever was running it, sees Aurora trending and says, oh, cool, you know, you guys are talking about our Kim Kardashian. Eh, not a good idea. So before you blink, there's like gazillion retweets. And I, I was online at this point, and I'm, I, I just started this Twitter um, column watching Sela Boutique. And boy, were they coming under fire. But the number of mentions and the number of retweets was just going through the roof. It was like, I couldn't follow it. It was like, I, I counted it when I was doing it. It was like 100 a minute. I, I have it in my paper. It was just like going poof, poof, poof. Um, the thing here is, this is an obviously not influence. What a like or a retweet or tweet or mention means I understand there's some ways you can aggregate it, but it gets very complex. So whatever data set you're looking at, there has to be some better ways of trying to get at this uh, and just not saying, oh, it's been retweeted or mentioned and therefore influence or therefore positive or negative or any of this. So this is an example of, um, these are very complex human interactions and the way people use Facebook likes I mean, if you use these uh, platforms, you know that there's a lot of complexity uh, to human interactions. And it's, ref it's not reflected on because in the, uh, what this platform is doing you is sort of uh, putting you through this narrow bridge. Okay, so importing of other network methods. The other things I see are these importing of network methods from, say, epidemiology, which has these great you know, sort of diffusion, contagion. You've all seen this, right? Infection, susceptibility, uh, recovery time. It's awesome. I mean, I love epidemiological research. I like reading it. Uh, in fact, I just finished rereading uh, the discovery kind of of um, germ theory and how uh, Steve Johnson's book, The Ghost Map, is awesome for explaining how people just couldn't believe that cholera could be waterborne. It's a crazy idea. I mean, little things you can't see in your clear water making you sick. You know, they went through every other possible explanation and did not get at this. So when you have epidemiology, you have a very specific physical theory that underlies why being near someone or drinking a water that's been contaminated is a very physical theory of this microbe, this germ, somehow that has an impact. Whereas when you apply the epidemiological theory to social interactions, well, what's your underlying germ theory? I don't think you can just have this, you know, susceptibility and recovery time and all of that and adjacency just kind of brought wholesale. Uh, sometimes I can see some of, especially the math can be useful, but they are not just math. It's kind of like physics. They have a very specific theory of why that happens. So unless you bring that theory into your network analysis, I don't, and I, I've seen the sort of unreflective here, let's use this. Um, but it seems like it, rather than just assuming it, that the germ theory is true or accurate, mm -hmm. right, you could ask the question of whether what you see is consistent with the contagion. You could theory. definitely That seems like a good that. methodological thing to do. That would be good. That would be, um, that would be a reasonable thing is to say, you know, do we have a certain level of susceptibility and does it work like the germ theory? But you still would need an explanation. I mean, you would, if you fit, I mean, more than one 
uh, theory can fit the same data set, so you would need an explanation. It would give you some clues. And there probably is a lot to it. But one of the reasons I think the germ theory kind of approach might be limited is that in networks, you're studying a lot of times node to node effects, right? So you're studying, you know, Steve to me, me to Steve, that kind of stuff. While human societies have these huge field effects, television, uh, this, is, um, this is a photo from the Mali coup that was just attempted recently. And what did the soldiers first attempt to storm? What do you think people first attempt to storm in a TV, uh, in a third world country? The TV station, right? Because there are field effects. How do I know this? I'm from Turkey. That's what our coups used to be. You know, you'd have your TV stormed and you'd turn on the TV and somebody would be singing a patriotic song and you'd be like, I better go buy bread. Uh, it was just sort of, yeah, you'd, you'd open, you'd hear the song and I think I'm conditioned by the song. Uh, right now, I mean, yes, in a lot of countries it wouldn't work the same way, but the point is there are broadcasts mechanisms. There are weather events. There are all sorts of things that affect the human society, the whole field. So if you're looking at recently, there was a Microsoft research paper, the video of which I saw yesterday, uh, that was trying to um, look at virality on Twitter versus popularity. And it wasn't said there, but I was just watching this presentation and I could tell some of the popularity came from television. I mean, I just looking at the network map, I was like, okay, so this got featured on Good Morning America because that's, you know, things can happen not because there's any note to note effect, but there's a field effect that's not in your data set. Or it could be there is bad weather over some place, or it could be all sorts of things that affect the nation, the country, the world as a whole. I mean, combined with the fact that uh, there's a lot of, you know, multi-platform stuff going on and combined with the field effects, once again, I am not saying that your data set is useless. I'm just saying there's a context to it that you have to consider what do you not have in your data and how to uh, examine these kinds of things. So somebody might, something might not be going viral. It just might be popular for a different reason. Okay, so this is um, the other thing. If you bring your, you know, models from uh, epidemiology or physics, you know, you got your icing uh, models and all that stuff. The thing that you don't have is that your germs or your electrons are not reflexive. They are not going to try to game the system. Whereas put a bunch of people in any setting and put any kind of incentives, and they don't have to be explicit. They just have to be discernible in their effects. You will find people try to strive towards it. I mean, you know, look at the things people do for karma points on Reddit, right? There's, you know, they look at the things that uh, people will sort of try to get at. But again, it doesn't have to be a very, it doesn't have to be a strong explicit incentive. If there are certain advantages to behaving a certain way, you will find more of that. Example, Facebook will show your stuff to more people if you put photos. This is like people have reverse engineered a news feed. If you post a photo, it's going to give you more comments and likes because more people are going to see it. I don't think anybody knows this. I mean, it's like it was reverse engineered in one little thing, and it seems to be true, but Facebook's not coming, and who the heck thinks about these things? But I am sure it encourages more photo posting behavior because you're getting more feedback. So this example I have um, is trending topics. Now, trending topics... Again, reverse engineered and in this term frequency, inverse document frequency, the things that spike are rewarded. T -t Trending on Twitter is a great way to get visibility because if you trend, lots of people will start clicking on the hashtag. And I have seen the activists, this is an example, you can find others in Bahrain, engineer trending. And I've never seen them openly discuss like how the heck they figured out. I think there's a lot of trial and error because I saw them fail too. They know to hold back. They know you're supposed to spike. So they have a, and they usually have like a unique hashtag so that it's a new term. And then they will all say at 723, we're all going to, you know, start using this. And then they all go crazy. I have seen them trend worldwide multiple times. This is killing Kawaja during um, uh, Kawaja. He, he, he's a leading dissident who's now jailed for life. Uh, and he, this was during the Formula One had its race in Bahrain, so during the same time they had this publicity fight and they kept managing to trend worldwide uh, hashtags related to the situation uh, and he was on a hunger strike at the time. So as soon as you put the word out there, 
there will be some reflexivity. As soon as you mentioned Google flu, might have found more flu symptoms, people are going to start Googling flu symptoms. I mean, it's probably, I, I don't know what happened, why Google flu inflated, but that might be one reason. So this is something you have to take into your account. Uh, and again, it, it's not necessary that people know what the rewards are. It just has to have an effect or be discernible. Okay, the other thing that um, I want to talk about is assuming things are additive. After all, I've said all of this. A lot of big data research assumes that you can add things like, you know, tweets, retweets. And as we discussed, since they can be all sorts of things going on, you might end up having to add as your first approximation. But I don't think you should lose fact of the, lose sight of the fact that adding is, um, that there's a lot of axioms that go with it. And whether you can add every retweet and get your influence is really open for debate. So I don't think, I mean, anything that counts a bunch of things, large number of things, and comes up with a result, you have to look at it and say, can I really add all of these? Because these aren't numbers. These are social interactions. And it might be that you can say, yes, you can add all of these, and the sum is a meaningful thing. And it might be that it's not as straightforward. And maybe you'll have you know, upper and lower bounds. There might be methodological um, ways of dealing with this. And finally, um, network structures and other attributes. So there was a great PNAS paper that was interesting, too. Uh, on cell phone connection networks, right? So they had an unnamed country that I think everyone knows which country it is that turned over their, uh, well, we're being recorded, so I won't name it, uh, that, that had turned over their cell phone records that people were analyzing it. And what they wanted to do was try to get at the strength of ties between the people using the cell phone records. So you're using network data to try to get at a non-network attribute because strength of ties between people is not a network attribute. And a lot of people just use frequency. This paper kind of used frequency too. And frequency of interaction, there's a lot of social science research on this. You know, sociologists have been studying social networks for a long time. It's one of the worst proxies for strength of the tie. There are a lot of people who interact a lot, including on the phone, who are not strong ties of one another. Uh, in fact, tie strength, I mean, there's been attempts at trying to get at tie strength using network structures. You kind of, the best method, you've got to ask people. It really is the case that it's one of those things that is hard to deduce just from looking at the kind of interaction people have. You get a sense of it at times, but there's so much uh, false positives and negatives. So when somebody's talking on the cell phone with somebody else, or, I mean, there are people I talk a lot on Facebook that if you use some of the Facebook strength of tie methodologies, they would look like my strong ties. They are not at all my strong ties. They're just Facebook active people, and that's the medium they use to communicate. This is especially problematic if you're using a single platform, because you're looking at a lot of frequency on a single platform. So you're really not seeing who I interact with most. You're just seeing who I interact with most on a single platform. And you're probably seeing Something besides strength of tie. And, I, you know, and I've seen papers, really good papers, published in top places that kind of are trying to do this bridge. And I understand you can get at some non-network attributes. You can try. But you have to be careful and realize that you probably have a large error component to your analysis there. So this is another um, this question. So I throw out tons of sort of methodological and conceptual issues that I see. And I don't see any of these as, you know, oh, you can't do big data research. I just think that it's such an emergent field that we should not um, think, oh my god, I've got, you know, a bazillion tweets and now let me do X and then um, sort of not publish. The one thing I didn't put in here, maybe I should, uh, was also collaboration with sort of people who are substantive who are interested in the topic itself. So like a couple months ago, some a friend of mine who's a big data scientist and is, you know, is a good sensible person, he tweets saying, I just saw this complex contagion model done by physicists. It could really explain the Arab Spring if only social scientists would look at it. I'm like, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm game. It's an archive. It's done by physicists. I'm going to go read it. It's a, I will see why it's explaining complex contagion. So I look at it, and it is a multi-step influence model. 
if I get back to my friend and say, you know that there is this two-step influence model in communication that's been studied for about 50, 60 years. It's one of the oldest theories, and there's an enormous amount of research. It's like, no, He's, they've never heard of it. And this paper that was supposedly explaining the complex contagion model did not have a single site to it. And you could find, you could literally, you don't even need to go to Google Scholar. You could probably go to Google and say multi-step. I mean, you, you, 10 minutes should get you some papers on this topic. And this is unfortunate. I'm not saying everybody does that. Uh, but if you're analyzing a topic, you really need someone on your team who is not just sort of the computer science people and the physics people, because they bring lots of stuff on the table. But there has to be somebody on the table who's going to tell you about the mechanisms of the thing you're looking at and the area of the thing you're looking at. Otherwise, we're just sort of, you know, we can have our physics people publish in Physic A, B, C, D, what, how many ever of those are. And you can have the computer science people. And it gets really hard to advance what the heck are we looking at if we're not talking to each other. So that's kind of my last um, comment on if this is going to go anywhere, it's going to really require a truly interacting multidisciplinary teams. Um, and that's, that's my presentation. Cool. So, I did leave time. We have lots of time for discussion. Anybody want to start? Paul. So this is a, a really stimulating discussion. And as, as we've talked about, it's you know, we're used to using survey methods, which we've had 60 years to per perfect. And it may be that with 60 years of methodological work, we can do the same with, with this. But, but for now, I, would it make sense to distinguish between three things you can use online data to study, one being individuals, one being networks, and another being events? Um, because it strikes me that online data are kind of limited for studying individuals just because a lot of people aren't online, but it's pretty good. But we kind of know who's online and who isn't. And we're learning more about who's using different social media. So it, it's kind of OK mm -hmm. for studying people, but not ideal. Um, probably not very good, even though it's been used for that a lot, because it's so hard to find other forms of network data. And ironically, it may actually be worse for studying networks, because precisely because of what you said about different kinds of interactions occurring in different contexts. So not only do you have incomplete coverage mm -hmm. of persons, but you have incomplete and unpredictably incomplete coverage of interactions. Mm -hmm. Third thing, though, is studying events. And it occurs to me that it actually may be best for studying events, particularly the sure. kinds of public events where you only have to have it reported by one person. You can tell if four yeah. people are reporting the same event. And it's likely that someone will tweet about it or whatever. So well, that's fascinating. So there's two things. You know, the sort of the concept of media events. Again, this is a sociology concept, like conventions. They're big media events. I think for those, those are, this is really great for studying events that are by nature sort of public and interactive. It's also great for studying how things actually happen on social media. So if you want to study Twitter, yes, by all means. I mean, how things happen in social media is an interesting question in and of itself. So, um, and there's been great examples of people doing that. Um, the f problem is when you then go, which is what you said, and say we're studying individuals, and you have what I would call data not missing, not at random, right? I mean, the methodological problem is that the data is missing, but you have no idea how to get your hands on what part of the data is missing. So events, absolutely, uh, especially sort of media and public events, I think it gives us a lot of insight. Studying the medium itself, absolutely. And the medium itself is important. I mean, how people exchange information on any one of these platforms, I think, is fascinating. Individuals, less so. Networks, you probably get in, um, I think you get some sort of interesting, especially conceptually, properties of networks out of this. And it is striking to me how similar some of these networks do look like networks from other uh, Topics. So to give you an example, I mean, and I haven't really thought this through, so there's a paper, science I believe, um, that it's an abstract paper, it's not about any particular network, looks at sort of the kind of exponential distributions, all those power law distributions as an equilibrium point, right? So it looks at, you know, because social sciences, we're used to these Gaussian distributions, but if you look in the world, there's a lot of exponential distributions. 
And it looks like exponential distribution as an equilibrium point, something that, you know, you rest that. Okay, so I look at this paper and I'm like, how does this work? Uh, what do I think about it? And then something interesting happened during the, somebody published the research uh, on this Alex Dunn, and she looked at the Arab Spring social media, especially in activist networks, and they're very sort of exponential distributions, too, if you look at their follower counts. It looks like every other kind of thing you see on the web, is that you have these long tails, and it's uh, you've got this hierarchy. So what happened is we had these natural field experiments where um, people got arrested. So you have this hierarchical network, and you know, you're one of your top people get arrested. So what happens? Does the network kind of become flatter, or does the network sort of jigger itself and become... Uh, hierarchical. Well, it turns out it becomes hierarchical again. But that to me is very interesting, right? Because it's not, I, there's some specific, there's something going on there that I don't really know, and it would be great for people who are looking at exponential distribution as a equilibrium and people who understand the mechanisms, and then maybe we could interview these people. And then maybe we could have some theories about how the attention ecology works, probably by its nature. Only a few people can get attention. Therefore, as soon as you move somebody out, somebody else gets the attention. It becomes hierarchical. So I think we could learn about networks, but we would have to go out of the network and see, you know, what are the mechanisms that underlie this network, and just lots of things that could be interesting uh, if we went off the, yeah. And I, am I moderating? I don't. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, sorry, I was a little bit late. I, this paper, this is great, and um, it's really resonating with some of the work at Kai recently on the, the caution of picking up the methods without the methodology. And this has been a big concern, especially with respect to things like cultural poems and, eth and uh, ethnography, that people are like, look, I'm doing ethnography without any concept of the right. analytical issues behind that. So, And I love also how this, detail, this dovetails in with the whole, there's no such thing as raw data. Um, I want to push you on one point, which you may have talked about a little bit earlier, but I know it was sort of in the background, but I want to hear a little more about it. And that's the role of the algorithms and the systems themselves in crafting Absolutely. particular kinds of data. And this is where I'm going to put on like a full-on STS hat and ask you to Go talk for about it. The no, totally great. But, um, the, there's there's something about what you know as Charlton Gillespie talks about the politics of algorithms. And there's something about yeah. the ways in which these particular systems are set up Absolutely. that encourage specific kinds of interactions, particular kinds of traceability. And there's agency there and, and politics there, not only in what it makes possible, but also what it makes opaque. So I'd love to hear a little more from your side about the role. Of I mean, it's how you talk about that. So totally like right on. I it. just didn't put it in here. In fact. Steve just said, but we were talking about this with somebody who's going to be a fellow here next year. There's right. a, yeah, so on. there was a huge, I mean, the algorithms themselves, there's a lot of, the sort of, you have to go into their epistemology because there's a lot of, um, to begin with, their feedback mechanisms, right? If you do something, you get rewarded, you get, you do more. Uh, there are exclusionary mechanisms. There's all sorts of things that are biased in the way that big data is produced to begin with. It's like, I, mean, I, I completely agree. I just thought this is such a noisy paper and a lot of people are doing a lot of that. Maybe I should write a note saying, here are the people doing this. I'm not gonna uh, talk about it, but uh, that was a point um, that comes up and really needs to be understood, especially if policy people are gonna start making um, decisions or companies are gonna start making decisions about what this data means because the data itself is structured in a very particular environment, and every one of them is different. You know, Google searches are different, and Twitter is different. I mean, for one thing, Google searches now don't include people who opted out, I think, or do they give those? I don't know. I don't know. For I example, right, so I mean, uh, so that, but that's a very good point. So people who are more conscientious about certain things are not going to appear in certain uh, platforms. and. You go downhill from there. I mean, there's um, so. I mean, great point. I completely agree. It's not in here because I have. It's a noisy already. You know, so many methodological things and um, Solon's work was. Ex and we we had spent last evening, not here, talking about that. Yeah. So a few months ago, one of the uh, big topics was the role of big data in politics in the election. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how some of the methodological issues. <laughs> you know, I know. Came up. Yeah, this is one of those thanks mom questions because I wrote about this. Um, well, 
I, I wrote an op-ed about this. It was maybe a little ill-advised because I got all my data science friends and you know, Obama campaign friends mad at me. Uh, but my point was, the, this kind of data allows certain things to be more efficacious by modeling better. It allows certain kinds of predictions to be done better. And that certainly brings a power component. So whoever has access to this data and whoever has uh, the means to use this data can do uh, better things with it. The other thing that concerns me with use of big data in politics is that by a, a lot, it's often used to do get out the vote. And it's very good for finding people who are very likely to vote for you, but not very likely to vote. That's your sweet spot. People who are not going to vote unless you nudge them. But if you do nudge them, they're going to vote for you. Appealing to that crowd makes your discursive space, your policy space, less important. Because they're already your people. You're trying to mobilize your people. right? So big data, by letting you mobilize your own people better, that's my sort of long-term concern, uh, makes the policy sort of recede to the background. Because we had this discussion, especially if you're winning, you just don't want to, uh, this was Ed's point, upset anybody. So if you're kind of little ahead, which the Obama campaign was, what you want to do is say nothing if you can help it. And you kind of saw this in the campaign. And they reached their people. You know, they would uh, put their ads in, you know, they would put their ads supporting gay marriage and things that were watched only by their supporters. They would try to reach out only to their supporters because they were trying to keep their position kind of under wraps. And that might be a good electoral strategy, and I'm not blaming any campaign for wanting to win because that's the <coughs> nature of the game. But it could end up with a politics that's more about just mobilizing and less and less about politics. That's kind of my broad concern with it. Um, Josh, did you have your hand no. up? Right. Okay. So you had your hand up? And then yes. I, yeah. I apologize if you covered the story. I might have missed it. But the one aspect I don't think you discussed was the recursive nature of the, the global, if you will, data collection that's going on now especially with respect to the underlying aspect of a common denominator being English, the use of English. I, I, I say common denominator loosely. I'm not trying to be <coughs> egocentric about the U.S. There are more people on Chinese microblogs than there are people on U.S. I stand corrected. But right. my point in any case is about the recursive nature of data collection. That is, when we hear what other people have collected or said, that tends to influence our contribution to the data set as well, sure. or even how we analyze it. Sure. I mean, it's, it's part of, you know, you have to look at who's, per, you know, you look, have to look at the incentives for participation in the particular system, which goes back to Janet's point, because the incentive structure of participating in the system is going to influence the data the system produces, which is a very basic point. Uh, so you have to just look at it. Again, it doesn't mean you can't collect this data and do nothing with it. It just means you have to look at, you know, what is it incentivizing? And very often, you see a lot of snark on Twitter, partly because it incentivizes um, this. It does a lot of other things, too. Um, and the Pew study, I'm, I'm still reading it. I am not very happy about the Pew study that the 10% US population also did some semantic analysis. And I'm not crazy happy with how they did it. Uh, so I'm not very confident. It just got, came out yesterday. I'm not confident. But they say there's a lot of negativity on Twitter especially might be true, but that would be related to the incentive structure. But again, I'm sort of, I need to look at their semantic analysis again. Sure. Um, I wanted to drill down a little bit into why you think, if you do, that um, there's a bigger methodology problem maybe than there was before or a different one. Um, what is it about big data that makes this problem worse? We've had bad methodology for as long as we've had methodology. Uh, and so why is it worse now? Okay, so one thing, it goes to Paul's point that, you know, survey method, we had very bad ones, but we had gotten pretty good at it. 
before we got worse at it again because so this is the evolution of methods and methodological right. wisdom is the, slow to catch up. That is one thing. The second thing is uh, I think there's a huge fetishization of it. It's so cool right now that you know people aren't really being reflective on what the heck is this. I probably would have welcomed this kind of day. I mean, this is like a social scientist dream come true. I mean, we were the people that if we could, we would put cameras on everybody and record them if we could get it past the IRB and that. Well, not all of us maybe, but we, I mean, it's very attractive data, but it just sort of flooded us in the past two years. And I'm constantly seeing now we're going to use this for, you know, solving this and solving that and solving that. And I'm looking at the data and saying, wait, there's, you know, that's why my subtitle is, well, they're a cowboy, which is kind of a joke. But, I mean, it's kind of like, let's look at what the heck it is that um, we are doing. And some of the problems are so structural that I don't think they could be solved. So you, just the way when you do survey research, you have a little asterisk that says, you know, we did this, but here's our margin of... I mean, we have certain ways of very reflexively self-limiting our... It, it take a while. It would take a long time to figure out how to do survey research really well. Drew versus, well, what is that, the Truman? Uh, the one that they, yeah. that's the Drew bad, beats Truman. Yeah, yeah, that's the bad polling. They, they didn't know how to randomly sample. It took, I think, it, I think, I think yeah. you're still bad. <laughs> I mean, there's, it's a lot better. I mean, we can do things like predict, you, you know, presidential elections. This is, I used to teach this methods class, right? And I would say, tell people, we can predict U.S. presidential elections with only a thousand people down to a couple percent. That's amazing. I mean, that's kind of a very neat methodology. Now it's getting weaker because of a bunch of issues, but maybe 50 years. It took 50 years. I'm not saying it's going to take 50 years, but again, some of the structural problems, you're just going to have them. So this is what you'd expect to see when new methods and methodologies are Correct. being discovered rapidly. Correct. And partly because of the social media environment, they are being, and because the information environment is so rich, they're just going boom. And if you give policy people, you know, here's the big data, it sounds cool and all of that. And I think they're really like, get your hand up. Okay, so given this sort of cautionary argument, what do you think a more considered theory arising that, that takes the specific characteristics of big data into account of like Okay, so you would, first of all, you would have platform-specific uh, cautions, right? If you were doing Twitter versus Facebook, you would have certain platform-specific cautions. And over time, you know, model organism people really collaborate with each other, so they really understand, you know, Drosophila weaknesses. So you would need that kind of sort of community around each platform. And then you would need to figure out what topic you were looking at. And if you were looking at friendship formation, you know, please, 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 there are people who study that for a long time, and they could probably tell you, like, so you would bring in some sort of... Right now, a lot of the paper are being written by people, many of whom I like, who are technical experts, right? They're good at getting the data, and that is a big weakness. So they're good at getting the data. They're physicists, and they're computer scientists, and physicists, of course, always naturally love to do this, right? They're... Uh, I, 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 have this, I have this friend, they're natural imperials, right? They, you know, here's the data set, and let me just throw some physics method at it. So, that's, I, so the, they would need to bring in, as equals, people from the topic they're studying. And then you would have to look at the topic and say, what are the specific weaknesses of this topic? So if you're looking at Bahrain hashtag, you would also need to go. So probably like three levels of platform-specific things that would be uh, common to the platform, and everybody working there would know. Uh, there would be topic-specific knowledge that comes from domain experts. And then you would have certain limitations associated with every... And that would just be the beginning of thing. And then you could talk about it. That's where I would like this, uh, if one could, to go. Josh? Did you have I hand up? question, actually. Where would you like to go? Which, which, well, well, no, which was, do you think that the right... I and mean, Your presentation was sort of a bunch of... Ca cautionary tales, if you like. Um, and do you think that the right answer is that people will eventually learn where to put all the asterisks in their no. work? Or do you think that there's a kind of a cohesive way New to know that you're knowledge. doing it the right way? Uh, or is it just going to be like call Zainab or some other expert? I think it would need to be a new way of doing it because if you just put the asterisks, I mean, because you know what happens with the asterisks that are kind of an add on in paper. Somebody writes the paper and says, by the way, our paper doesn't mean blah, blah, blah. And then you have a headline that says our paper. Yeah, it's, that's not going to work. You have to build in that stuff from um, the ground up. Do you have your hand up in the back? Yeah. 
Yeah. What exogenous yeah. factor you didn't talk about very much was simply um, Facebook and Twitter as profit-making entities. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly the effect of the particularly the effect of the promote tag in Facebook and such like that, which are yeah. distorting your data in order to make in order to make some in order to make some in order to make somebody money, which they are then in order to make somebody else money, which they are then paying Facebook. Right. So this goes back to Janet's point and the platform specific issues. Every platform, the for profit platforms have various things associated with it. Non profit platforms, you know, or, or things like Reddit where there's karma points and networks, there's always something specific to the incentive structure and the epistemology of that. So you think it's the same, so you think it's the same sort of thing and not a separate concern? I think it's like I'm not going into the weaknesses and strengths and ex, you know sort of specifics of each platform, but what I'm saying is everybody should look at their data with that view. And you know, is it there, is there a for-profit environment? Is there some sort of incentive structure? Is there karma points? Is there this? Right. So totally. Great. So our time is up. Um, thanks very much. Um, Thank you. Those who can stay are welcome to stick around and continue the conversation. And course, especially suggest the place where I can submit this paper. I am really struggling with who the heck, you know, where's the interstate, where's the journal that would, because I know the computer science journals and the physics journals, but they're not going to have the social science reviewers. And social science papers don't yet publish big data, and they're going to look at the same and say, of course you shouldn't select on the dependent variable and move on, because this is not interesting to them, they know this. So anybody has suggestions on where the heck you can, you know, submit this to? I would really welcome this. And other criticisms, very welcome too.